Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Mitchell. I'm president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. It's great to have everyone here with us this morning uh, for a very exciting discussion, getting a bit of a, a insight into spring 2022 market update with the Canada Infrastructure Bank. As many of you may recall, last November, the CIB's board chair, Tamara Vruman, and CEO Aaron Corey gave the bank's first market update at our annual conference. Things are moving for the bank, and since it released, especially since it's released its $10 billion growth plan in 2020. Uh, its priority areas to invest include clean power, broadband, large-scale building retrofits, agriculture irrigation, and zero emission buses and charging infrastructure. Today, Aaron will provide a recap of CIB's past year of new investments and discuss new opportunities. But first, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we acknowledge the land we gather on is the traditional territory of many indi Indigenous nations. I would like to acknowledge that since I am in Ottawa, I am on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Nation. I recognize that we're all joining from different places and that therefore you work in a different traditional Indigenous territory. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on that and acknowledge it. It is a pleasure to host Aaron for this important update today. In 2020, Aaron joined the bank as CEO, bringing his strong leadership approach, infrastructure expertise, and track record of delivering results by partnering with the private and public sectors. In his role, he is focused on the CIB's strategic direction, including implementing the $10 billion growth plan to accelerate infrastructure investment in Canada and building the CIB as a results-oriented organization. Prior to joining the CIB, Aaron was the president and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario, which Many of you would have encountered him in his role there as well. Uh, the, many of you know that Infrastructure Ontario is a provincial crown agency responsible for financing, building, and enhancing the value of the province's infrastructure and real estate assets. There will be a chance for audience questions through the next hour, and I encourage you to do so. On the bottom of your screen, there is also an area where you can pose questions to Aaron. Um, there is also an ability to vote for questions if you'd like to push them up the queue and ensure that you get an answer in case there are many. Um, I'd also note that on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll notice a comment section, and there's lots of greetings and good mornings there already. Um, so if you haven't uh, if you haven't found that already, you can share links and information with us and and with each other. Now, I without much further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Aaron. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Um, boy, I uh, wish we were in person screens are always a less than perfect way to do this. I love the chat function on the side though. It's nice to see some familiar names. If we were in a room, I would be able to actually look at you and say hi, but it's nice to see many of you colleagues from, from our work at the CIB. And as Lisa said, from my previous role as well. Uh, really excited to be here. And as Lisa said, we're looking forward to, I'm uh, chat Lisa and I, and then, but questions from the audience, I do encourage them. We're always interested in talking uh, with our stakeholders and, and having an open dialogue. And I'm really excited, as Lisa said, to talk a little bit about our progress over the last year. We're a Crown Corporation, so we work on a April 1st to March 31st year. So this is a really good time to summarize sort of our results of the year past, but also to talk, look ahead and talk about what our priority focus areas are and how we continue to look to partner with many of you uh, on this uh, call and many of you in the Canadian market to get more infrastructure built faster to the benefit of Canadians. Uh, thanks also, Lisa, for uh, the land acknowledgement, which I think is incredibly important. We're all uh, on territories of Indigenous peoples of many nations. I'm in Toronto, uh, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. A very rich history here in Toronto. Toronto continues today to be the home of many First Nations, uh, Inuit, and Métis peoples. and I really think it is important for us to always remember, especially in the infrastructure world, uh, the reality of the land we find ourselves in and the importance of working with elders past and present uh, of all backgrounds to get uh, uh, new infrastructure built for the benefit of our country and for all of our citizens. So maybe just uh, if I can start, Lisa, well, I'll just do, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll have a nice chat together. As you know well, and many of the people, of course, in C2P3 know the CIB and its history, but maybe not everyone does. We're a crown corporation that's been in operation since 2018 and with a mandate to invest $35 billion of public money in infrastructure projects. And we do that in five priority sectors, clean power and green energy, broadband, transit and trade and transport. Those are the five sectors we're currently focused in. 
And we do it in partnership with all levels of government. Of course, the owners of infrastructure assets, often municipalities, provincial governments, with colleagues in the federal government at times, with indigenous communities, and in collaboration with the private sector and institutional investors and pension funds. Our big focus is on getting more infrastructure built faster because of the positive outcomes that infrastructure delivers. Growth, economic growth and job creation, greenhouse gas emission reductions, better connectivity of Canadians through both transit and digital connection, and closing infrastructure gaps in Indigenous communities. So our goal is to focus on those outcomes and deliver more infrastructure. So uh, the last year has been a real year, as you say, Lisa, of momentum and growth. There's one thing I could leave you with is that we are on a different trajectory at the CIB these days. Uh, uh, you can capture that in numbers. I can capture it even better in real projects and real examples. But in terms of just straight numbers, we're up to now 28, as of March 31st, 28 uh, projects where we've made firm investment commitments. Those have a value of total $21 billion or so of capital value of those projects. The CIB is just over $7 billion of that money. That in, then in addition, of course, there's money from other levels of government and importantly from the private sector. That $21 billion of projects, it's across all five of the priority sectors, and um, the pace of that has grown significantly over the years. So as I say, we're up to, in our history, we're up to 28 firm investment commitments, 20 of those made in the most recent calendar year or the most recent fiscal year that just ended, excuse me. Um, a different way to talk about our momentum, though, is to talk about the partners that we're working with. Uh, the CAS on our REM project, our first investment, but since then, uh, farmers in Alberta, Algoma Steel on a change to their facility, N-Wave and their uh, 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 investors, teachers and IFM, municipalities from coast to coast, indigenous partners like the Chouette and Rail uh, Transportation Company or Coquistaha First Nation, interesting entrepreneurs like Enner Store and Edward Shurn and her team and Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation who are her partners in, in their project. So partners in both the private and the public, ISPs, I should mention, to, to get broadband uh, to hard to access areas. So a different way to measure our momentum, different than number of projects and dollars, is to talk about partners. And a third way to think about our, our momentum is around outcomes, where we're at uh, well over 3 million uh, tons a year of GHG emission reduction through the infrastructure we're building uh, as it gets into operation. And you can talk about specific projects like where you, I mentioned N-Wave as a partner. It's a great example of a project where our collaboration with them will expand their network, reduce GHG emissions by 60 to 70,000 tons a year when finished. It's like taking 12,000 cars off the road. That's a different way to think about our momentum. The zero emission buses that we're doing with Brampton or Edmonton or school buses in Quebec and British Columbia are all ways that we are focused on putting non-emitting buses on the road, taking GHG's uh, emissions out, having cleaner, safer, quieter transit options in our communities. So these are all ways, the REM project, increasing transit ridership uh, when it opens uh, over the next, uh, later this year and then into 23, 24, uh, increasing crop yields, a different way to think about outcomes. Our Alberta Irrigation Project, which is in construction uh, across ir irrigation districts to add 200,000 acres of irrigated lands in Alberta. These are all examples of the outcomes we're having. Um, I guess I just want to talk a little bit about the future then. So that's the past, that's the momentum we have, and you should expect to see that continue. I hope many of you on this call are now working with us. I do want to just talk to the future. Our mandate, as we'll, you will have seen, and Lisa, we can get into this, but it, it has continued to expand. The budget identified a number of areas uh, within those same broad five sectors, but new areas of investment focus for the CIB, increasingly in areas of privately owned, but public good infrastructure. So these are things like the deployment of new nuclear technology, small modular reactors, which will help accelerate the transition to a net zero electricity grid and is so important to getting to our, our goals. Um, the rollout of electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the country, making sure we have a viable public network of charging to support the rapid uh, conversion to electrified fleets, or working on uh, carbon capture utilization storage or low carbon fuels, hydrogen production, transportation and distribution. All of these are new areas, the budget signals uh, that we should turn our attention to. We're 
already having great conversations with the market on those things. We think they're all perfect examples of where the CIB's approach, partnering with the private sector, sharing in commercial risks to get projects over the line and get projects that otherwise might do to financial, commercial, technical risk be stuck to get them unstuck and over the line. So we're really excited about that. And we're working on some really big things, things like the Atlantic Loop, which is uh, a regional intertie uh, connecting a number of Atlantic provinces to help accelerate their transition to cleaner electricity. Interesting rail projects like the high frequency rail project, of course, with the government is working on the dedicated route, the Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City corridor. We've been working on that for a while, but that's really accelerating. We're also working on an interesting transit pro uh, uh, rail project in, in Alberta uh, from the airport through downtown Calgary into Banff, where we're working um, with private sector and public sector on the business case for that. We're also working on new area, new things on building retrofits. And there's going to be a lot in this space, I think, in the next few months, both with public sponsors. We're working with cities, the, the city of Edmonton, the city of Calgary, a number of municipalities that we're talking to, provinces, and also private building owners. So lots to come. A lot of big, uh, quite transformational things as you look across the country that we're working on. And uh, I think that momentum is only going to continue. Great. Thanks. Sorry. Having challenge, technical challenges of my own over here. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate it. And, I, you know, I think, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, you and Tamara uh, were at the conference in November to provide a, a bit of a bit of an update. I think, you know, hearing you speak and, and outline things, there's there's momentum. I think that's probably what I would take away from from sort of the number of projects that you've announced. Uh, just in the last fiscal compared to to the years years before. And you've been on the job now 18 months. Um, what do you think has, has has changed at the bank? How have things evolved? You know, it's still relatively new, but uh, but uh, be curious to sort of hear hear your views on that. Well, I think a, a few things have changed. Um, first, I think we've just gotten much more uh, as we've been in the market. As just a natural. First of all, the team has done a great job. The progress and the momentum of today is a reflection of not just the last year but of multiple years of hard work and the hard work of many people on this call in terms of fleshing out projects infrastructure projects do evolve at at a certain pace but i would say there's two or three important things that have changed that have changed our momentum one i think we've gotten much clearer and more disciplined in targeting the gaps that are stopping projects from happening you know we are and many of the people this is the the Council on Public-Private Partnerships. So I know many people speak this language, but for us, it's really, we look to partnership, not so much in what I would call the more traditional P3 approach of risk transfer or risk allocation. I mean, that's important, but what we're really thinking about is how can our public dollars and our investment, how can we take a patient long-term risk sharing approach to unsticking projects? And so it's all about, for us, identifying commercial gaps. You know, when we do it, when we do a, zero emission bus project, I just use a simple example. Zero emission buses cost more upfront to buy, but they have cheaper operating costs. You switch from diesel to electricity, you have fuel savings, and you have maintenance savings because they're easier to maintain. But they also have uncertainty. Not everyone is confident. Municipalities aren't all confident. How will the buses perform over 10 or 12 years? How will the batteries survive Canadian winters? How will our charging infrastructure work and the efficiency of that? So there's uncertainty there. And if we can share in that by making a loan that covers the higher upfront cost of the bus and shares in the risk of the performance, so the municipality is, expects to see some of those operating savings, but those operating savings are also what's going to pay us back. And if they don't fully materialize, we don't get fully paid back. And the reason for that, again, it's all about trying to de-risk or address the commercial gap or the, the uncertainty that's slowing the project down. Without us, I think municipalities would make the transition to electric buses, but it'll take much longer. They'll pilot a few buses. They'll wait five or six years, see how it's going in other jurisdictions. What we're trying to do is accelerate that change. The N-Wave project, Lisa, that I was talking about earlier, it's a great example. What we're doing is trying to help de-risk the long-term acquisition of customers. A, a, a district energy system, when you build it once, it's in the ground for 50 plus years. And there's lots of uncertainty over those 50 years. How much development will there be? How many new buildings will come online? What's their customer profile look like? And therefore, what's demand growth? 
So we look at that and we say, huh, if we can make a long term loan, perhaps defer payments for a while until that customer ramp up happens, can we help you build the system bigger than you would have commercially? So again, that's that's the first change. I think we've gotten much better at targeting technological, economic and commercial gaps in projects and saying, how can our money advance the project in a way that it otherwise wouldn't? I think the second thing is we've gotten much more streamlined in our approvals and decision making. Uh, I say this to you as a former colleague on our side of the table, you and I work together on this, but I think we've just matured the relationship, how, how this works. You know, government, we're a crown corporation, which means we are meant to operate independently is why we have a board, but also we're meant to operate in a context. I mean, we're, we're, it's 35 billion of public money and we shouldn't be shy about saying, we're trying to achieve policy goals. I think what we've gotten really good at is government setting those goals, net zero transition and GHG emission reductions, transit ridership, broadband, the government has framed those outcomes that we should be focusing on, but they've given us a lot of, of, opportunity and discretion in making investment decisions, doing what we're good at, which is structuring deals, setting the commercial terms of that, and our board approve those in a very stream. So we're able to make decisions fast. We made, I don't know how many, just in the last quarter of the year, the speed we're at, but we're doing four or five investments a month, some months, right? And so that pace of action, having the, the governance right where government set the objectives, but we do the deals, has really allowed us to go faster. And I think that's just a maturing of the of the concept and of the organization. And I think the third thing is, as we've done a few, it's a self-fulfilling thing, Lisa, as we do a few, doors open. You know, like you do a, I talked about Zebs, you do that with a few municipalities and you talk to great partners like at FCM, you go to places like Q-Trick, like you talk to some of the partners and it's exponential. And my district energy example, we talk to three more people who have district energy projects when you do one. So I think there's a self, uh, a, vir a virtuous circle happening as well. That's the third thing that's accelerating our momentum. And that's why, that's why, honestly, that's why doing something like today is important to us is because I think there's, I hope there's people listening who's saying, yeah, I have a great project. It's a fantastic project, but it's stuck because I can't get over this hurdle. I should talk to these folks. And so that's, that's the third thing that's I think happening is market momentum is helping us. I think uh, to pick up on sort of one of the things you said, having worked in a crown myself as well, too, I think that understanding of the role of a crown and how it fits into sort of the overall government context, I think, is a really important conversation to have. And I think one of the things that you pointed out is sort of operating within that context. Yes, independent and have ability, but, but you know, government setting the priorities. And I guess budget 2022 is probably a really good example of, of how that relationship works. So wondering, and you touched on it a little bit, but you know, this is, it really demonstrates an expanded mandate for the bank on, on the green signs, on the green side of things, you know, tackling climate change. Um, what does it mean for you guys? I'm wondering if you could, you know, talk a little bit more and I guess, you know, not just what does it mean in terms of moving forward on the green side, but what does it mean for the other more maybe traditional asset classes that you guys had, had looked at as well too? Well, it, I mean, we're really excited about, about, uh, some of the the new areas of focus to us they are as i said earlier they fit still within the same broad themes and the same broad sector definitions but they are areas that i think offer um tamara has this expression that i love she talks about multiple word scores i'm not a very good scrabble player but i really gravitate to this we used to talk about triple bottom lines once upon a time in this industry but this idea of, of scoring on multiple fronts the thing that that all of the CCUS, low carbon fuels, hydrogen opportunities, SMRs, the thing they all have in common is they deliver on, yes, our climate goals. You're absolutely right. They help build resilient new infrastructure for the long term that that accelerates our trans the transition we have to make. It's not, it's 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 not even a choice. It's a it's a thing that's happening, but they it puts us focused on the infrastructure for the next generation. But that infrastructure also drives economic growth and jobs i don't just mean in the building of the infrastructure but i mean in the potential for export the potential for economic growth that come out of them if we are leaders in some of these areas they will provide both opportunities for canada to meet its emissions goals but also our trade uh, trade goals you know green hydrogen is an export opportunity for us as well it's it's a fuel source small modular reactors if we do it right it builds a supply chain uh, so so we look at it as i say with with the view of multiple positive impacts and uh and so we're really excited 
the budget, they're, they're all areas where we've been having really active conversations with the market over the last six months or so. And I think there's a lot of project opportunity um, and a lot of great entrepreneurs and great companies who are well down the road of advancing projects in these areas. And so we're excited to be in conversations now about those projects coming to final investment decisions and our potential for participation in them. So I think, I mean, and you touched on this a little bit too, in terms of the P3 space. And I think, you know, being the, the, the council for public private partnerships, there's a lot of people here really curious to know about, you know, how you guys fit in the space. I think there's a lot of nomenclature that's shared between the P3 space and, and, and the bank. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, in terms of leveraging private capital in the P3 space is it's, you know, it's really a tool to enable that risk transfer. Um, I think you used the word risk sharing earlier. So, you know, wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, your innovative investment approach and how that's different maybe than traditional financing models and, and maybe also where it might be similar. Yeah. So I think the, the, the big issue for us, many of the projects we're doing, most are P3s of some form. And P3s are a spectrum of definition, that's for sure. But the vast majority of what we're doing are some form of P3. Not all of them are, but the most most are. Um, we though, I think, I think just what's where where we're where we're slightly different is we set out. We're not we're we're quite model agnostic. What we're trying to think about in each case is how do I address the the gap? What's the risk that I can? So kind of the opposite of a public. I used to work at I/O. My job there was to do a public private partnership to offload some of the risk that otherwise the public sector naturally held. In our job now, it's literally the opposite. I'm looking at projects and saying, what's some risk we can onboard onto us to help make the project go? So in my case of Zebs, that risk otherwise is going to sit with the municipalities. How can I help share that with them? In the case of a hydrogen fuel project, the risk might be around customer demand ramp up and revenue projections. And so how can I help them get up that curve? There's a great business case, but it depends on customer adoption. It depends on probably the direct the trajectory of carbon pricing, you know, so it's got some big dependencies. So we're looking at projects in how can we help de de share and, and reduce that risk to the entrepreneur who or the, the company who's doing that hydrogen project or to the municipality who's making that bus investment. So it actually gets us to a very similar place, but it's quite a different orientation. You know what I mean? Because what we're active, we're doing is looking at what's the risk we can help, uh, we can help uh, share. You touched on this as well, as well too. And, and, you know, full disclosure for the audience who might not know me, I, I did come from Infrastructure Canada and was was responsible and worked with the team that, you know, helped stand up the, the bank in its original days. And I think, um, you know, talking a little bit, you know, you highlighted some of the things that have changed since you've come on board and how that momentum is growing. Um, I think one thing that, I, you know, we picked up on and this attaches a little bit to the to the previous question, but, you know, the CIB, you know, is a tool to attract private sector investment. And one of the things that we found sort of in, in terms of the changes and the evolutions of the bank is, is the description as an impact investor. I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on, on that. And, you know, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I, it, that's a great question. I do think that it's really important as a crown corporation for us to be clear on, on what our objective is. We are trying to take public money and leverage it to get more infrastructure built than would otherwise. And the, the only way to think about that is you've got to start from, we care about returns in a different way than others doing the projects, right? And we care about not just the financial returns, but we care about outcomes that the projects deliver. The way we look at investments, which in people, people might find interesting for us, that Zeb's example, zero emission bus example I gave earlier, the way we look at it is what's the amount of money we're investing and what's the money we're putting at risk more, more, even more importantly than how much in dollar terms, but how much is that risk if the buses don't perform? So we do sensitivity of what's the dollars that we're putting at risk compared to what's the outcome we're getting in terms of tons of emission reductions per year. And that's actually the ratio that like, that's our ROI. That's the investment we're making. And I think, so that is what it, that's what impact investors do. I think that framing Lisa, which you're right is language that's relatively new for the CIB. It's, it's, 
it's what was the original concept by our founding fathers and mothers you i think that was that was the intent but i don't think we were sharp enough in explaining to partners especially into the x i think we understood it internally but i don't think we were communicating well enough when you come to us with an investment what we should be talking about is what's the outcome this delivers in terms of new transit riders or new homes connected to broadband or ghg emission reductions or whatever the outcome is and how does that compare to the money we're putting at risk because that's that's what taxpayers should be looking to us for is to put money to risk to get big outcomes. And so that's what we treat. That's how we make our investment decisions. So I think that that's uh, there's a question from the audience. And I will just remind folks, because um, there are quite a number of questions there, uh, Aaron. So we'll, we'll get to some of them. I have still have some of my own as well, too. But uh, just for those who are looking to ask a question, there is an ask a question uh, tab at the bottom of your of your screen. And um, and we you can add your question there and, and we'll, we'll see how many we can get to. But one of them that came through kind of ties into that uh, a bit, Aaron, in terms of, you know, uh, Bay Street Partners. Uh, in financing P3 infrastructure, but, you know, how do people engage with you? How does that, how does, you know, where, how does the seed get planted? Right. So I, it, it's interesting. We've, um, because of our focus, most of our conversations start from project owners and it's two way. I mean, we have certain uh, almost products at this point, you know, building retrofits would be an example where we've actually designed an approach where what we're helping to do is for both building owners or aggregators who can service a bunch of buildings where we can provide a low cost risk sharing loan to go do deep building retrofits, like to really put buildings on the path to net zero or get, you know, substantial efficiencies. This building sector is one of the hardest to get at. So we've designed, a, I would say, a standard product. So with those, we can we can really go to the market and do outreach. But what we're talking to is is project owners. On the other hand, we have lots of inbounds as well. Where, what uh, Again, from project owners, people who are working on transit projects or, or trade and transportation corridors. What I think is has been interesting in our experience, because I, I see the questions as well, usually we're at a, working at a project level, usually. And we're working on a real, because we're trying to accelerate that project. And so we are not a fund of funds. You know what I mean? We are actually working and we're either creating project finance as type structures most of the time or something close to it. Um, however, we are starting to play with, you know, buildings are a great example. I mentioned the aggregator model. What we're doing there is we've provided a, in several instances now with partners like Sofiac in Quebec, which is one we've done so far, which is, of course, it is in turn, Sofiac is a creation. People might not Sofia not know Sofiac, but it's a creation of a labor-sponsored pension fund and a private equity firm. They created this entity. We've put money into it as well, and it is going out to now make loans and do energy retrofits, hiring energy services companies to do retrofits in event in in buildings. So it is a bit more of an aggregation model where we're partnered more with, let's say, the financial players. But on the majority, and, I, and we're open to more of those, but on the majority of our projects, what's interesting is, like N-Wave is a great example. Our partner is N-Wave. Carlisle, who's the CEO at N-Wave, is our partner in that project. They happen to be backed by some of the largest pension funds in the world, and including a Canadian one in Teachers. And so our capital is going in alongside Teachers and IFM. But, but it's not like us and Teachers and IFM sat down and said, where can we deploy our money? N-Wave came to us and said, we've got an expansion project. We can get money out of our shareholders for equity. We can get money from the from the capital markets who will lend us money. But the, to make the project even bigger and to get a 50-year impact, not a 10 or 15-year impact, a loan from you would get us there as well. So my point is that we're partnering with teachers and IFM in that investment, but we're doing it through the operating vehicle and through the project level, if that makes sense. Yeah, and while we're talking about process, and you touched on this in the opening as well too, you know, opening the kimono a bit, you know, in terms of you know, early stages, how do people engage with you, and who, you know, how do you find the projects that you're interested in? But, you know, now that your portfolio is growing, how do you make investment decisions? So, sort of the back end. So people yeah. come to you, you're doing all the due diligence, and then, and then, you know, then what? And you know, what characteristics and attributes, you know, you know, are you, are you really looking for in those projects? Well, first, I should say for for those who don't know, we the way we're organized, we have investment professionals. We got a really we're almost up to 
I think uh, we're, we're close to 100 professionals. We have offices in Montreal and Toronto and Calgary. And the majority of those staff are in our invest, what we call our investments teams. And they're organized by those sectors, at least at the managing director level. So we have a managing director who's leading our work in broadband or leading our work in energy retrofits or transit. And those teams are out there. At, so if you're a person on this call who's working on a, a clean energy project, um, we, we definitely, we have someone, we have a place for you to plug in, if that makes sense. So that's the front end, Lisa, just to be clear. And I, and the work of those teams has been incredible over the last 12 months. So I, if any, I don't know if any are, are listening, but it's, it's pretty awesome. And they come from a really diverse mix. They come from banks, they come from infrastructure investors, they come from advisory firms, 80% of them come from the pri directly from the private sector, but we've got a few who came from other crown corporations that would include me. We've got a few who come from, we have a couple who come from the federal government to join us. So we've got a nice mix. All of us have some private sector experience. 80% came directly from the private sector to the CIB. And I think the reason they came is because they were excited about the idea of use, of doing the investing they were doing or the advisory work they were doing, but doing it with public outcomes in mind. So to answer your question, what they get to do now that they didn't get to do before, lots of people talk about ESG, but or about sustainable investing. I go to a lot of conferences. That is all we're doing. Because as I said, our investment framework, which I described earlier, compares outcomes to dollars at risk. And so the way we make investment decisions is we have uh, a funnel that we're managing of dozens of conversations across the country, but eventually those res we resolve themselves. We make two big decisions. One is we sign a term sheet with a partner that defines the parameters of a loan or equity investment, usually loans till now, often, as I say, risk sharing loans. So there's some subordination or there's some contingency to them where we start to get repaid if X happens. Sometimes there's upside to that as well. So if things go really well, we're getting the benefit of that. So they're somewhere in the loan or equity box. And we sign a term. So we, we negotiate a term sheet that comes to our investment committee. We evaluate them based on, as I said, outcome for dollars at risk. We go to our board and get approval. We sign a term sheet and then we do very typical due diligence, usually hire an LTA, a lender's technical advisor to help us do both the technical and financial assessment of the deal. There are often finalization of things like the final capital costs that are also happening in that time. And then we sign, if it's a loan, then we would sign a, a credit agreement and loan documents and start to flow funds. So that's our investment process, pretty standard. It's can go as fast or as slow as the project. Like we're never the bottleneck to that process, really, ever. But it's got to be timed to the project. Sometimes the bottleneck is that the project doesn't done isn't far enough advanced from a technical standpoint to have a final capital cost. Well, I can't loan 30% of the cost of a project if, if we don't know what the project is, right? So there's just natural uh, time takes time, as they say. But that's our process. We're pretty quick and disciplined to work with. If you're in one of those sectors, then it, it is purely up to our team. And then eventually, uh, John and I, John Casola, our CIO and I, who take those to the board and get approval and, and, uh, and, and sign. So it's a pretty quick and commercial process, if you will, uh, on the back end. I think that's I think that's helpful for you know to to people understand and you know having been in the public sector I think sometimes public sector decision making is always a bit of a mystery to to folks so I think it's good to understand how you guys how you guys look at things um, I, I want to switch gears a little bit if it's okay Aaron um, I mean earlier this week the First Nations Major Project Coalition had their conference uh, I heard it was very very well attended I watched online myself a lot of talk about infrastructure um, for in the two days that that were there um, you know. From your perspective, from the you know what the CIB is seeing, you know, what can be done differently to help improve the infrastructure deficit in Indigenous communities, and, and what are you guys doing to to try and support that? Right. So I, I, when I mentioned outcomes, I, I think one of the I, I did mention this, but one of the clear directions from the government to the CIB is along with outcomes around GHG emission reduction, transit and broadband connectivity, trade capacity is the objective of closing infrastructure gap in Indigenous communities. So I, I have a two-part answer, by the way, at least to your question. So the first part is about how do we get more infrastructure built in Indigenous communities? We have um, 
had some real success stories. We started that was that direction came to us last year about this time. It was last March, I guess. So in the first year, we've had some real, really interesting uh, success stories. I mentioned that in our partners, I, I mentioned Kukwistaha, which is a First Nations of Saskatchewan that we're working with on this project. Um, it's it's we're doing enabling infrastructure for an expansion of a of an urban reserve and what's what's so interesting to me about this project is it's uh it's not a reserve in the way many of us canadians perhaps have historically conceived of them it's it's urban it's in it's just outside or in 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 the borders of actually uh, saskatoon and it's to build out a community and to build the enabling infrastructure street water broadband the enabling infrastructure that underlies that community and we've partnered with the first nation with a first nations bank and with the community to build this infrastructure and the lesson we learned out of that so that's a 15 or so million dollar loan from us to do some of the enabling infrastructure so the the lessons for us were out of that and i think it's really instructive for where we're headed number one we had we had to scale a lot of what we do if we're going to work in those communities because the infrastructure whether it's my Kakwistaha example, or if we were talking about getting an indigenous community onto cleaner power sources, because so many are on, on diesel or other fossil fuels, if we were trying to get them to clean, it has to be at the scale that the community need. water would be the same thing. It's got to be at the scale the community needs. And the CIB's general threshold, I didn't say this, but many on the on our Zoom might know this, um, we target investments of $100 million and bigger of our money, which means the project is some multiple of that. Okay, well, that's just not going to work for in-community infrastructure. So we've had to design simpler tools, easier legal agreements, easier due diligence process. There's, you can't put the same burden on a $15 million investment that you would on a $500 million investment. And so we've worked really hard at that. We have a great team on our side that works and partners with Indigenous communities to, to come up with those types of projects. And we've got, so that's one tra track that we're on. The other, and and uh first nation major the major project coalition have actually been really good at helping us understand what the barriers are to those projects the other track is about in our bigger projects how do we increase the participation of indigenous communities because with linear infrastructure in our country for instance the license to to build and operate absolutely must include our indigenous partners, you know, so I think of a project like Oneida Battery, I mentioned Enter Store and Six Nations of the Grand, which is our first project in this category. This isn't indigenous community infrastructure. This is a large scale, hundreds of millions of dollars, one of the largest battery storage projects planned for North America. And it has great indigenous ownership and equity investment and stewardship of the project in the form of the Six Nations of the Grand's development corp. Who are partnered with NR Store and their and the rest of their team. And for us at the CIB, we really actively are encouraging that sort of thinking around major projects, whether that's transmission or transit. And we're working with Indigenous communities how we can support them in their participation in those types of projects as well. So it's got to happen at both of those scales in community. And then how do we how do we get the license to build and operate on big stuff? Yeah, and I think that that very much aligns with sort of the discussion that happened over 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 the two days. So uh, it's a, it would be an interesting space to watch in terms of what can yeah. be accomplished. Um, I'm I, I'm going to turn a bit to the to some of the questions that are filtering in, Aaron. If that if that's okay with you, there's there's yeah. quite a few. Um, uh, there's a question from Bruce, which a lot of people uh, are very interested in, in hearing. I think yeah. you can see them on your screen too, but for the benefit of the audience, uh, regarding EV charging infrastructure, do you see the priority being commercial municipal applications, sort of supporting fleets of buses or trucks, or general public applications, so passenger car EV charging stations? Right. So, uh, great question. And we're, uh, I don't know if my answer is one or the other, but I'll say it this way. In our work on zero emission fleets, like on the bus pro program that I talked about earlier, to be clear, if we're working with the city of Brampton on the Accelerate or Ottawa or whomever on the, those, both of those are pro projects we're working on, on the accelerated conversion of their fleets, that has to can include the purchase of buses. I talked earlier about fronting the higher upfront cost of the buses and managing the risk of performance but it also has to include the charging infrastructure to support those fleets and oftentimes 
there's broader investment to make that conversion maintenance maintenance and storage facilities re, uh, critical spares retraining of of maintenance crews like it's 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 a systemic change it's not just about buying the buses it's about changing the system and so to be clear those investments and we do that in oftentimes in partnership with the municipality but also with the federal government and our colleagues at INFC who have a program called the zero emission transit fund which is about supporting i would call it those broader enabling investments like garage conversions or that sort of thing so when we do a fleet to answer Bruce's question, when we're thinking about a municipal application, we are already, and, and this was predates the budget, we were already thinking about both the purchase of the vehicles, but also the charging and maintenance infrastructure to support. So that, and I think you have to do it that way. There's no point in buying electric buses and, and not having the system to support them. The net new thing for us in the budget and the place we're focused is really on general creating a public network and getting to scale quicker of, of a public EV charging infrastructure that supports the more rapid conversion of all of our fleet, all of our personal fleets <laughs> to uh, to electric. Now that happens in a lot of places, right? That's in, in, that is in commercial buildings and places of work. It's creating public access uh, through a network. Uh, it's all of the above, but it really is the new focus for us. And we're working really closely with colleagues at Natural Resources Canada, who have already been in this space. So we're working together on what's the joint offering. A lot of those EV charging facilities are going to be commercial. It actually matches really well to some of the other analogs I've given Lisa over this call of like, there's a, cause I think with charging infrastructure, if you actually play out the economics and we've seen this in other markets as electric vehicle adoption goes up, if they charge a reasonable price per minute or price per KV of, of electricity, they're actually commercially viable. The challenge is how quickly they're going to become commercially viable as the, and there's a chicken and egg problems. Like they aren't commercially viable until they have a certain utilization and they don't get to that utilization until EVs get to a certain penetration, but EVs don't get to that penetration if people are afraid of not having sufficient charging capacity or infrastructure and getting stranded or whatever. So there's this loop. And what we're trying to do is short circuit that loop by accelerating the investment in that public infrastructure. That why that's such a good thing for the CIB to do is because for many those don't need a grant. They don't need government subsidy. What they need is manage, help them share the burden and the risk through that commercial uncertainty until they get to the point of being economically viable. And that's why the CIB investing eventually we will get paid back. And actually, we might even make some money out of that if it goes well, right? But we can share in that risk and we can say to entrepreneurs, and I think I think this is a place where the private sector is going to be great and we've had tons of outreach already just since the budget from from people looking at this we can invest with them we can help them manage through the uncertain in years and get to the point where these things are standalone economically viable at that point our money will be out and we can put it to work on the next infrastructure priority so that's where we see the priority bruce thanks for the question yeah, and I think it's 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 timely to see what opportunities there are for the CIB in that space. Uh, rising costs of gas. I know in my in my circles there are a lot of people <laughs> considering making the switch these days. So which means demand will just go up. So it, it'll be an interesting space to 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 you know keep an eye on. Uh, we I'm going to switch um, gears a little bit because we talked we've touched on this a little bit already in terms of the bank space and the P3 space. I mean the umbrella of available alternative delivery models in Canada is mm. is is I would say exploding in some ways. Uh, lots of innovative thinking. Um, so there's a question here from Peter about progressive design build and other IPD models gaining popularity with the builders and the contractors especially. So how can CIB embrace these new delivery models and maintain healthy project bid responsiveness? Curious to get your views on this one. First of all, hi, Peter. Peter and I used to work together. So I, I, I wish we were in person. I'd like to, anyway, great to see you. Great to virtually at least see your name, Peter. I hope you're well. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's it's a really good question. As I said, we're always trying to think about, we're quite agnostic to models. So we're doing some projects and we're looking at a real range of project delivery models. So let me give you a few examples uh, just to show the diversity. Mm -hmm. We're working on with, especially, and Peter's question refers more to, I would say, publicly owned infrastructure than privately. Because as, as you can tell, in our work on EV charging infrastructure, for instance, that's not going to be probably publicly owned infrastructure. That's going to be what we can do to help accelerate a private market. Broadband's another example. What we're doing is we're helping ISPs manage the risk 
and the cost of getting to less dense, more remote places and getting those places on the network, that's privately owned infrastructure with public good. But others of our assets, Zebs I was talking about earlier, or if we were doing energy retrofits in public buildings, transit systems are often publicly owned infrastructure. So we're on both si sides of that, if that makes sense. I think Peter's question refers more to public. So let me talk about a few examples. In some projects, Contraca, which is the port expansion in Montreal, would be like this. We're also working on some energy projects that fit this mold, where what we've done is provided a financing solution. We've negotiated that with the owner, you know, Port Authority of Montreal, or in the case of my power example, um, which I don't think is public yet, but I'll just say with, with the province in question. And that financing, and it and the, it's a financing that fundamentally shares in some of the revenue side again, some of the demand risk that's going to come and the ramp up. You know, Contraco is a great example. There's going to be increasing trade. We know this. We know there's tons of demand for new shipment capacity. We don't exactly know. None of us know exactly the rate of increase of that and how trade flows are going to work. And so there's uncertainty in those economics. That's what we're helping to manage so we can get that port expanded. We've provided a, a tool, that, a, a financing package that does that, which becomes part of the bidding process. All bidders can avail themselves of it. They need to meet some basic criteria of creditworthiness, but basically they can build the CIB into their bids. So to Peter's point, that is a way that we embrace all, I, we're, that works in any delivery model and we're completely agnostic. Basically it allows the bidders to propose. We're also, uh, to use a different example and the, the, Request for expressions of interest on high frequency rail would be a good example of this. We're very clearly exploring more developer led models where what we're doing is going out and and similar to your exam, your question, Peter, about progressive DB, but where we're going out early and picking a uh, looking to pick. We're not at that stage yet on HFR, but the, the way we're thinking about it, at least, is working with our colleagues in the federal government via to select a, a development partner. And then to develop out the project and to create aligned incentives with them where we all have real skin in the game to deliver the, the best value, highest NPV solution, which encompasses not only construction cost, which is often the focus of, uh, of the historic public procurement, but also ridership, quality of service, and therefore ultimately the NPV the service delivers. So that's the way we're approaching this. And I, as I said, I think that's our approach is allowing us to be active in a lot of different models. All of them fit, Lisa, in my view, the broader definition of partnership between public and private, and they take a lot of different forms, including including IPD. I think you've got uh, a whole lot of people really uh, ridiculously curious to know what this energy project is. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, confidential. I don't know. I, I just I can't remember that I'm. Oh, Stay tuned uh, and do our digging once it once it is it is public. But you touched on this a bit too in the conversation about sort of public versus private. So there is a question here uh, from Natasha about um, whether you could talk about successful examples of ISP broadband type projects. And you know I, I, you've mentioned a couple as as we've talked, but maybe digging a little bit deeper. Yeah. So broadband is a really interesting space for us. We've had uh, great traction. As I say, that's privately owned infrastructure for public good. Our first investment in broadband, it's still one I, I'm really, I find fascinating. It's it's in Southern Manitoba and it's with a, a company called Valley Fiber. We're working on a, a project called the Southern Manitoba Fiber Project, which is getting uh, high speed access to around 45 or 50 different communities, smaller communities and urban areas around them in Southern Manitoba. And what's interesting about that project, of course, is you've got a local ISP, a regional player. They have significant private capital backing them. They, they have a, uh, they were, they have an, a significant investment in them from, from DIFF, which is, which many people callers on this uh, would know as one of the larger infrastructure investors in the world. So it's a really neat mix of a local or regional ISP and a global pool of infrastructure capital and the CIB. And what we've done is we've, again, helped them, we've helped lower the water level, if I can say it that way, on that investment by helping them go faster, get out to those communities. You can imagine if if DIFF and and the team at Valley Fiber were doing that together, they would have 
a certain 10 year capital plan and they'd slowly build out to these communities. And depending on the revenue of the first few, they would then use that to reinvest in the next few. What we've done is help them accelerate that whole process, get order all of the fiber at once, get to all 45 or 50 communities quickly. And there will be a ramp up. Those are all communities, by the way, that today don't have high speed internet. Our focus in broadband to Natasha's question, we have a very clear focus, which is getting 50, 10 minimum speeds to every Canadian. Um, so we're not investing in downtown Toronto in, in or getting, getting to the next level of speed, if you will. We're really focused on the million or so households in Canada that don't yet have access to functional broadband. Um, but what, what we're doing in that investment, again, is de-risking the customer. Those customers have a lifetime value. And it's all going to be about penetration rates, how quickly the project gets to those penetration rates and how sustainable it is. It's also going to depend a little bit on um, the density of population in those areas. Like the economics are challenging for some of these projects, especially the further remote we get. You know, it's a pretty basic math of density. So our investment is allowing those projects to happen quicker and where the ROI for the ISP, the ISP is making their capital plans and it's falling below their return threshold. And they're like, well, we have better places we could put our scarce capital than to getting to the, the broadband to that next 10,000 homes. And so that's what we're working on. And it's, it's, my, my Manitoba example is just one. We've done that extensively in Ontario. We've got uh, our next one negotiated in Western Canada and we've got conversations going across a bunch of provinces and regions. It's such a critical uh, asset class, uh, which I think was just well. And I, I think the pandemic has shown us the pandemic has shown us that it's it's yeah. somewhere close to a, a necessity or human right, even in terms of access to healthcare and education and economic opportunities. It's uh, all of all of the above. That connectivity matters a lot. Flipping back to sort of on the green side of, of things, there is a question from Scott, uh, recognizing or you know acknowledging that maybe C CIB can't fill all the gaps. Uh, what would be the challenge you would put out to the market regarding the transition to net zero? Well, that's a great question. I, I think, I, and I and absolutely, we, we are one tool in the toolkit. So I, I Scott's bracketed comment about we can't fill all the gaps is exactly right. Oftentimes what we're doing is trying to, as I talked about commercial risk, you know, like in my building, I talked about zero emission buses earlier, but let's talk about building retrofits because it's a great example. Again, the uncertain, there's long been cases for energy efficiency and ESCOs have existed for a long time. And the classic challenge, of course, is you got to make that investment up front. And then in theory, you're going to see savings over a bunch of years in the future, which hopefully will cover the cost. Now we've got an additional, so, and that was already kind of, a, that was an equation people knew, it has risk to it, but that has gotten significantly higher when what we're talking about now is much deeper retrofits of buildings. And the way the economics work is they really depend not only on energy savings, but sometimes on carbon credits that get generated and therefore a, you know, a market that doesn't even really, or is still evolving, let's say. I was gonna say it doesn't exist, but it, it's still certainly an evolving and not mature market, which is around, the price of carbon and how that works. So if you're a building owner today or a, or a, or a company like Johnson Controls who does this across a bunch of buildings or an aggregator of some kind, the risk is significant. We think that by us doing some early ones, we will prove out the market and eventually won't be needed. As that uncertainty goes, like it's a temporal thing. My Zeb's example is the same thing, right? If we do this on batteries and we have some buses that run their full 10 year life and perform as expected and the savings are real commercial banks will do what we are currently doing and i and and owners will do it and, they, and we won't be needed to be that risk bridge and i think that's true on energy retrofits i think that's true in a number of places i think on low carbon fuels again the the economics actually look quite good once you get out far enough like i said on ev charging infrastructure so Scott, part of what part of what I think we're trying to do is be catalytic or to to show or prove out things such that we're no longer needed. Other than that, the challenge I would put to the market is I think that for all of the talk about ESG as an important investment lens or, you know, I go to conferences all the time and I and I most I go to them 
I say in air quotes, I mostly sit in this chair, but you know what I mean? I, I, I visit conferences all the time. They're talking about this. And, and I listen to our private institutional investors, our banks here in Canada talk about how you don't have to trade off returns for sustainable, environmentally sound investments. You know, there's, it's not a, it's not an either or. And, and I agree with that. But even more so, the challenge I would put to them is you got to take a longer run view of these things. And the vast majority of them, if we accept that infrastructure are incredibly long lasting assets, the question isn't whether they'll pay it back. The question might be the payback period. So you got to be patient capital. You got to build more flexible financing structures so that, you know, like there's a there's a rollover if we're not if we haven't fully been paid back so that the term can extend like there's ways to do this but my challenge to the private market is take a longer term view think about the true life cycle of infrastructure assets so many times we're talking about a 50 or 75 year asset but we're making 15 year financial decisions which i just i think the market is not being a bold or aggressive enough and i think when i listen to people in conferences say you don't have to trade off economic returns for ESG. It's almost like thou doth protest so much. Like they say that, but I don't think they believe it. And I think it's the reality. I think many of these things in the long run will, will pay for themselves. I think bolder action by the private sector to embrace the uncertainty of the next few years is going to pay off for them if you look across the life of an asset. And so if they did more of that, we, less of us might be needed. And that would be great. Or it would at least be complimentary to us. And another area that there's a lot of uh, discussion about right now is affordable housing. Yeah, uh, there's a question here from Michael um, that are there initiatives on funding affordable housing, maybe by you know via land value capture process, uh, in partnership with government and the private sector that that you guys are are thinking about. Right. So right now, as I've talked about the outcome, the, you know, in my in my meta governance conversation earlier, we were talking about government sets outcomes, and we. And, and we agree together on the sectors to hunt for those outcomes. And then we go do investments. Like that's the chain, the flow. In our outcomes, when I talk about them, you will note that increasing housing, housing affordability or the, at the stock of affordable housing can, isn't one of our targeted outcomes right now. That's actually, there's other parts of the federal government that that is. If, you, if Romy was here from the CMHC, she would say that's on her list. I do think it's a space where in the longer term, we're going to continue to see innovation and whether that's the CIB or others like us, I do think that a lot of the same principles we've talked about here about risk sharing and about improve, closing commercial and financial gaps, they would work there. But I just want to be clear, that's not an area that CIB plays right now. But just because I, I do love the question, I will say this, we are absolutely talking to people about all the ways the innovative ways to repay or to take and share commercial risk on um, projects that are in our sectors. So I, as an example, like on transit projects, transit-oriented development, special area charges, tax increment financing, all of those, we would, we would, and we are exploring those and actively pursuing deals in those areas, not because we have an outcome of affordable housing, but we have an outcome of getting more transit built. And we'll take repayment from riders or from development that comes. You know, actually, it's funny, but if you go back to my N-Wave example from earlier, the risk that we're sharing with N-Wave is actually around development. It's around the growth in their customer base, which is fundamentally about future development and new buildings and commercial buildings, multi-res buildings that get built adjacent to their network and that join into their network. Because as they do that, there's a positive climate benefit by using a district energy system rather than being using a bunch of natural gas as a building right so we are implicitly taking a risk sharing position with our partner on development well we'll do the exact same thing around transit projects which we think is a great so again we're not doing that because we're in the development business we're in the transit business but we're willing to take and share at least commercial risk around demand growth on the transit itself, but also demand growth around it, which could include development. So stay tuned, <laughs> maybe down the road. But I think your, your point on sort of transit oriented development and transit oriented communities, I think is, you know, is, is, is a good one because there is quite a bit happening in that in that space right now. Um, this feels like a little bit of an unfair question. So, you know, crystal ball it a little bit. But, you know, what what's 
what's the outlook look like for the CIB? You know, what trends are you seeing? You know, what's 2022, 23 fiscal going to bring bring forward for, for the CIB? Well, I think, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about, Lisa, but I, I do think it's a change for us is and it's why the moment i think our momentum is sustainable is because I, th I think one of the other things we're doing differently is we've taken a real portfolio approach infrastructure is a lot of things right and, and it's the rem a six billion dollar transit project it's also broadband in southern manitoba it's also uh agricultural irrigation systems in rural alberta like it's and, and I think what's been important for the CIB's maturation has been to think about, uh, we sometimes talk about working at two speeds. You know, like there are some projects, Zeb's with the, with the city of Brampton can go from conversation to term sheet, to investment deal, to bus orders pretty quickly. Interprovincial transmission in our country is complicated. It involves multiple utilities, multiple regulatory bodies, multiple provinces, uh, it, they are, they are uh, complex environmental assessments, uh, like they're, they're, they are different beasts. And because of that, I think we really have had to think about the CIB as working across a portfolio. And so to answer your question, what I think is going to be different as we go forward, what the market sees, the momentum we've got now, you know, 20, 20 uh, investment commitments this year. So we're at 28 now cumulatively from our start. A lot of those are in areas that I would say were in that um, quicker cycle times, right? But that, if you look at where our work effort is, a lot of it is on seeding longer, you know, talking about small modular reactors. We've been working on that for a year or interprovincial transmission or low carbon fuels. And so I think as we go, what you're going to see is that a, the, that portfolio continue to balance. Like we'll have the, the, you got to hit singles and doubles and home runs uh, to to be successful, and I think that I think when the CIB started, we hit a huge home run. We did the we did the REM project, but then we had to then work on finding the next of those, and there's a trough. Now what we're doing, I think, is we're layer we're much smarter about layering that cake. We've got a steady flow of building retrofits, zero emission buses, broadband projects, and then we're also working on larger scale transformational type of investments that that really move the needle and i think 22 and 23 that balance is going to continue to sort of get to i would say the longer term status quo for the cib you should expect to see us continue at about the pace we're at we think for the cib kind of like our steady state is every year we should be putting out about four to five billion dollars of our money that should be multi multiplied by our private sector partners, by other public levels of government, of course, who might be putting money into those projects as well. So we should be getting between 10 and $20 billion of infrastructure built as a result every year. That's kind of the most we think, like that's, that's kind of steady state for us. That's the trajectory we're now on and we expect to continue on. That's great. I feel like we could kind of continue to talk for hours. Uh, and there's still a number of questions in in, in the chat room, but I I am very uh, aware of, of of time, and we have gone a bit over. So, um, Aaron, thank you. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I think this has been uh, not only sort of informative of you know what you guys are are up to, and you know what recent budgets and things mean for the future, but I think it shed some light in terms of you know the processes and and how people get involved and the way you guys um, collectively at the bank think about things and and move projects forward. So I think it's been it's been very helpful. I think um, I learned some stuff as well too. And you know, it wasn't that long ago I was there <laughs> across the table from you guys. Um, I thank everybody else. I, thank you. I just I sort of interrupt you, but I thank you. And I I'm seeing some of the questions too. I'm sorry we didn't get to some of them. People want to follow up with us. You always can. And I think there's some, I just would note, I see some really interesting ideas, both in the chat and in the questions. You know, there's a there's a comment about resource roads and, and work that's most recent, or it's at the bottom of the list. I don't know if that's the most recent or the oldest, but I just, I'm scanning here saying, oh yeah, I wish we'd gotten a chance to talk about that too. So please, people have things they want to talk about. Always know that uh, we're really open our job is to find creative ways to say yes to stuff, right? We're not in the no business. We're in the, how do you get more stuff built faster business? And so we'd love to hear from people who have interesting ideas, people who think something I said on this call is totally misguided. We like hearing from those too. They make us smarter. So 
anyway, appreciate the dialogue, Lisa, and audience, and I and I look. Great, thank you. And yes, I mean, I you know, I have your contact info here, and then you know, uh, you guys are very open to to hearing from folks. So you know, apologies for not getting to all the really interesting questions. Um, I thank you everybody for joining us today. I appreciate everybody coming out uh, virtually. I look forward to seeing everybody uh, at one point in time face to face. On that note, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that uh, we have an upcoming uh, in-person reception that we'll be holding in, Tor in Toronto uh, on the 12th of May. So if anybody is interested in joining us there, we'll be at the Assembly Chefs Hall in Toronto. I have seen the menu options. It looks amazing. Um, tickets are available, registrations available on our, on our website. Um, and we'll also be moving into uh, the fall. We'll be getting ready for our... And, uh, it's already going under underway, but our 30th anniversary of the C2P3 conference, uh, which we hope to see people there as, as well, too. So, Aaron, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to continuing to, to, to dialogue with you guys on this stuff. You got it. Thanks, everyone.